I've noticed lately in my excursions to the public library, the zeal to lionise New Zealand being the first country to give women the vote has reached almost religious proportions. With it, a Joan of Arc-like creature on our $10 note, Kate Shepherd. Perhaps it's emblematic of a small country trying to establish its status on a planet where just 1 in 1,500 humans is a citizen. As a country, we continue to plug a granting woman the vote as some sort of watershed moment for the entire planet. That and other minor historic blimps are taught in schools. Lumped as gospel on websites that should really know better. There are some serious historic caveats that I need to point out concerning the assertions made about the emancipation in New Zealand. Not least, Kate Shepherd was not a feminist. A hell of a lot is left out of the fuzzy catch cries and educational material on Kate and her mates. Those I'm sticking the blowtorch to here, some won't like it, 50% is my best guess. Starting with the most obvious point, that it was New Zealand men that changed the Electoral Act in 1893. Male politicians occupying Parliament at the end of the 19th century deserve a lot of the credit. They were the ones, after all, with the real power to effect real change. Those MPs had the most to lose, in that they could lose their seats in a backlash from male constituents not happy with the proposition. And why were those so-called sexist, misogynistic, unwashed pigs of Kiwi men preventing equal rights? The main reason was it was women, sick of their hubbies coming home pissed from the pub, that were at the forefront of the temperance movement at the time. The two movements were attached at the hip. Giving women a greater electoral power would embolden the teetotalers. A first step for them, all the boozers would close. It could therefore be argued that because the leading suffragettes were all similarly high up the temperance movement, their dual action actually delayed enfranchising suburban females. The ones who were happy being housewives and mums and letting their menfolk letting off a bit of steam with their mates at the pub. It's a strange dichotomy that these fire and brimstone fun police are now viewed with the same light as pussy riot. That they were somehow trailblazing feminists. Even for the day, they were considered prudes. They revelled in traditional values. Woman being at home, nurturing children, baking cakes. The man coming home with the bacon, sober. Attending Bible study midweek, marching off to war with Mother England, observing the Sabbath. That was the reality of Kiwi feminism in 1870 to 1900. Shepherd herself helped start the Christian Temperance Union. What a forward-thinking organisation they weren't. The minutes of their executive meeting in 1912, held in Dunedin, with Kate front and centre, passed the following remits. The government should be throwing more emphasis into teaching of home economics at a higher level. Men that couldn't control themselves around women should be isolated. Specifics aren't mentioned, but camps spring to mind. Failing that, imprisoned, sterilised. TABs and gambling should be banned. Oh, so progressive. Knowing what I've told you already, if Kate Shepherd and her mates were alive today, which side of the abortion debate do you think they would be on? The right to choose? Or that only God alone ordains if his creation should live or die? I know where my money is going, if I was allowed to bet that is. Anyway, those concerns as to where granting the woman the vote would go would later be confirmed when the temperance movement chugged along post-1893 and the country failed to go dry by a whisker in the 1919 prohibition referendum saved only by the soldiers' postal votes. Going back to my introduction, to see how important the preservation of this byline in world history has become here in NZ, how the topic of women in New Zealand being first to vote has grown legs, let's first open the pages of this book. The New Zealand publication, Number 8 Wire. A book that focuses on New Zealand inventors and inventions. Oh look, there's St Kate and a white halo. And wow, granting women the vote in New Zealand was the very foundation of what? Democracy. Democracy. Start burning the books now, which falsely assert it was the ancient Greeks. Now, before you think this is this one overly earnest author of a single publication with an eye on the fact half his potential clients have two X chromosomes, to show you this narrative is now taken as gospel in schools and on the net, 
Let's read what the official government history site has to say on their page headed Woman and the Vote. Now my local council website spouts more pretentious drivel. Getting down to brass tacks, one of the next so-called self-governing countries where men granted all women the vote at a general election was Finland, third off the mark. Does anyone think the Finns cared one iota about what happened in New Zealand 13 years prior? Scandinavian politicians there thought we'd better follow New Zealand's lead. Most couldn't place us on a map. Are Kiwis that naive we think that what happened in New Zealand actually went on to influence the Norwegians, Danes and Canadians etc that followed shortly thereafter? The principal reason change happened was the same everywhere. There were votes in it. It's what the electorate at large wanted. Now let's go back a step to the very concept of equality and social reform and get out of the small pond a sec and look outwards and behind. Prior to universal voting rights for all adult citizens, voting was the privilege bestowed on those that just owned land. Way back in 1737, a Swedish woman, landowner, could vote. Hardly egalitarian, I concede. Therefore, for the majority of history, in what we'd like to pigeonhole loosely as Western democracies, non-landowning men were similarly disenfranchised. The first time a non-landowning male in England got to vote was not until 1919. More pertinent to this story, it wasn't until 1879 the New Zealand Qualification of Electors Bill allowed non-landowning men over 21 to cast a vote. Male suffrage in New Zealand gets about as much attention these days as a plus-size male model. Then we get to the rather awkward bit about the right to vote in 1893 and the elections going forward into the next century. That right went to citizens only, British subjects. A convenient way to exclude aliens, in particular Chinese, as they weren't considered a citizen. Lump them with Germans and anyone else that had English as a second language. The fight for equal rights in New Zealand didn't extend to the wife and daughter of Chinese gold miners, oh no, nor the husband or the father, many of whom had arrived in the country well ahead of the Liverpudlian shepherd. Being born Chinese in New Zealand at the time didn't change your status. I doubt you'll find it on many websites or publications that indicate that Kate Shepherd largely fought only for the rights of New Zealanders, those from the Empire, and Maori to vote. How many of this recent photo from Auckland Girls Grammar would have got the vote in 1893? It's relevant to point out Maori Wahidi, however, were permitted to join both movements and did so. Preferable in Shepherds and the minds of her fellow party peepers, those citizens held Christian values. The role of woman being in the home and certainly not enjoying a night out with the girls trolling the bars on Lampton Quay or the Auckland waterfront. Sport was for men folk only. Placing more fuel on her pyre, she would take her obsession with purity of race into the realms of eugenics in her role as the president of the National Council of Women, an organisation that had lapsed and she resurrected in 1918. At their 1919 AGM, the spectre of feeble-minded couples being able to breed was raised. The National Council of Women passed a remit to pursue a goal that, quote, encouraged better classes to reproduce. The magazine of the National Council of Women, White Ribbon, and yes, White Ribbon Day and White Ribbon Mag are intertwined, ran this charming article in 1931. And no, it's not translated from German. Then, I mean, what sort of stereotypical sexist magazine would run a section called Homemaker's Corner? Oh, that's right, White Ribbon as well. Normally I enjoy looking through old period magazines. White Ribbon, though, it was hard going, I tell you. They certainly weren't for social change. In this article in 1935, the Auckland branch painted teetotaling Hitler in glowing terms for preserving the strength and efficiency of German youth. Moving on. Nor was White Ribbon the only publication Shepherd played an important part running. The other was called the Prohibitionist, and don't expect a page three girl there. That's before we even get to some more awkward facts of history. When you scrape the surface on the broad term of first to vote, and technically it was the Cook Islands woman who did so, but as they were part of the realm of New Zealand, let's just forget that happened. 
From this, the myth New Zealand was a global beacon of social reform extends. While selected women in New Zealand were indeed the first to cast a vote after the Cook Islands, they could only vote for men. True electoral equality wasn't granted till 1919, that's 17 years after Australia. Trailblazing Azerbaijan granted women the right to vote and stand in elections before New Zealand. And of course, woman power meant New Zealand Parliament was soon full of female MPs right from the get-go, eh? Nah. Let's look at the same size Finland for a sec. In the first election in 1907, when Finnish women got to both stand and vote, in 17 and got into Parliament, that's them. In New Zealand, at the 1919 election, not one female was elected. 1922, zero. 1925, zero. 1928, zero. 1931, zero. Wait for it. In 1933, in a Littleton by-election, New Zealand elected its first female member of parliament, Elizabeth McCombs. Her victory was somewhat tainted by the fact it was her husband that was a standing MP who died in office. Coat tailed her dead hubby, having f- been flogged in the Christchurch North at the general election in 1931. Russia, Ceylon, Burma, China, Armenia and a whole suite of other nations elected female MPs before New Zealand. Five elections in, the results indicated to a certain extent New Zealand women were using their newfound empowerment, at least in a small part, to elect New Zealand men. Women still huffed and puffed a lot when it came to the booze. The original insufferable suffragettes hadn't lost hope they could still close all the pubs and continued their failing cause for decades to come. But when it came down to stepping out of the crowd and onto the stage, campaigning for office, women tended to shy away, not put their names forward. Within the ranks of the original leading suffragette, say Auckland's Sophia Taylor, pictured, there were those that thought it was unbecoming of a lady to even be a politician. In other part of her politics, Shepard was similarly stuffy and conservative, was against women exerting themselves with sport. Shepard's belief chicks aren't up to it doesn't seem to have deterred New Zealand football though. They've named a trophy after her memory. Fair coverage, some of the National Council of Women at the time supported participation in sport only because it made healthy child bearers. Kudos to Shepard though in respect to her fortitude. On the hustings she went through a lot of torrid public speaking events. What's more, it would take that incubator of progressiveness in New Zealand till 1999 for the country to have its first female PM. Over a decade behind a pioneering social laboratory called Pakistan, a place where a 50 year old man can buy a 12 year old bride and where sex outside marriage is a prisonable offence in 2022. That's where I'll end this one today. Let me end this by stating there's plenty of good stuff to celebrate in our history without making stuff up. Leaving out the awkward bits of someone's life to fit in the modern narrative does them a disservice and makes one suspicious as to what else has been airbrushed out. Nor am I in favour of pulling down or vandalising statues and the like. These people were products of their age. At least the women of the suffrage movement stood up for what they believed in. We need to salute their tenaciousness. However, feminists, in vaguely the most modern sense of the word, they weren't, not by a long shot, stop painting them as such. A more accurate description would be Puritans. Place Kate Shepherd in a room of Kiwi women today and she would be at odds with the entire group, unless you were at the Glorvale Commune. Throughout her time in New Zealand, Shepard campaigns as much for traditional British Christian values and banning alcohol than she did for equal voting rights. Thanks for your time today, being a good boy or girl and getting this far to the end. And for that, I'll give you a gold star. Deliver me a dozen lion brown cans and in return I'll send you one. Sorry about my voice today, I'm suffering COVID. My voice is poop. Spot you again next time. Bye for now.